Tough Fish show, I am so excited to bring to you Sonia F. Blanco. Sonia, thank you so much for being on the show. Hey, Jen. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I am so glad that you are. And I would love for you to start with how'd you get into writing? How did I get into writing? So I think I've always been a little bit of a writer. I'm just a very creative person. But when I first get into actively writing was a few years ago when all the ideas in my head wouldn't leave me alone. Um, <laughs> so I had like these fantastical worlds and then these characters who were having full on dialogue and it just kept building and building. And it got to the point kind of like, you know, Dumbledore where, you know, he's like pulling the ideas out of his head and the memories and putting them into the pensive. It was like, I just needed to free up some brain space and just do this story and all these characters some justice and, and get them down onto paper and then share them, like make them more real instead of just living in my head. I love that. You know what it kind of reminds me of? There is a movie called The Man Who Invented Christmas, and it's about um, Dickens and how a Christmas carol came up, but there is literally a scene where he is in his office space and he's looking around at all these characters and they're looking at him like, whenever you're ready to write for us, you know, like share our stuff, we're ready. And he's looking at them going, oh, I'm working on it kind of a thing. So I love that your characters are in your head, like, hello. <laughs> yes, very, very much so, very impatiently. And it was just to the point where you know, I felt like the conduit in just sharing what they're thinking, what they're feeling and what they're saying to one another and what's happening in the world. And so it was more of, of me just being that conduit and then sharing the story. So was there one character in particular that kind of spoke the loudest that really helped to kind of bring the rest of the story or the other characters along in such a way that it was like, you just it just the, was the one that was the most intriguing or something? Yeah, each story is a little bit different. So it's usually the protagonist that will be the most vocal. And then I know that's the one that the story really needs to focus on. But then there will be other characters too that will come into play. And oftentimes I'm like, I need to rein them back. I'm like, hey, you're not the protagonist and you're not the main star. So we got we to gotta pull you back. We might do a spinoff series at some day, but for right now, we're just going to tone it down a little. Um, so it's, it's, it's a little bit different each time. But you know what that reminds me of? It's almost kind of like having your character sitting at a table near you, and then you're telling them, hey, you, we've already had this conversation, and they're looking at you like, I can't believe she just told us this. <laughs> like, oh, yes. It's like full-on memes, like at all <laughs> times, right? Like going on. Yes, but I, I love that because I, I love the creativity that's come through and that you that you were willing to, to see what would come from it, that you were willing to say, okay, fine, let's see where this can go. Just start writing. So was it something that when, as you started to take these dialogues, take these, these characters that were in your head and put them down on paper, did you see a story develop in the sense that you had a structure that you started to build or was it something that started initially as I just need to write out this scene that's in my head to get it out to clear up the mental space and then a new scene would show up and it may or may not be in the right order but it's a new scene for these characters I hear like a couple of different things one is there's free writing which you know you could always call also call journaling or whatever where you're getting those random snippets and you don't even know like what it's about. And then you just, you write it out and sometimes it goes somewhere and sometimes it doesn't, but you just need to like free write, you know, write poorly sometimes, or just write exactly like not filter just to like get that all out. So there's that aspect of writing. And then there's, you know, I, I'm really getting serious. I'm going to sit down and write a novel or a book or some kind of very pointed story, whether it's a micro, you know, short story or whether it's a full long epic fantasy novel. And for me, when I want to write the actual complete story, I do have a process. I'm more of a, of a plotter. So I've got like left brain, right brain, and I will, I have a very specific formula that 
I have developed, it has worked well for me, but I don't let it control what I'm, what I'm doing. I still let the characters drive the story and it, the story can change organically, but then I still have this structure that I'm working with. And, and that helps me kind of stay on task to see, okay, what's the end goal for me? My big thing with my writing is that I want it to be clear. So I don't like the writing to just be wandering around aimlessly without a direction. And that's more for like that free writing fun part where it's not really going anywhere if you just want to get out an idea. But for the story itself, you need to keep moving it forward. And I like having the structure to do that. But then also, like I said, let the character still develop and kind of control where the plot is going to lead to, because sometimes they'll come up with like the randomest, like, you know, thoughts or sayings or like, they'll do something. I'm like, well, I wasn't really planning on that, but let's go with it. And then, you know, now you're kind of not in like in a totally different direction, but it's just like something that's just like that much richer. So curious how you might, how would you guide someone who maybe might be newer in the writing process, or especially if they're writing um, a fantasy and they need to plot out some structure. Do you have some suggestions that worked for you or that perhaps you said, I'm glad I tried that, but it's not something I would recommend. So what would you recommend to a new writer who is trying to build some structure for a fantasy? Uh, Blake Snyder's Save the Cat is a really good one for structure. There's, There's a lot of other story developers and everything out there, but if you start looking at all of them, which I did too. Like I studied the craft quite a bit and you can really start boiling it down, right? Like every story has got the beginning, the middle and the end. And then the way that you tell your story and even like what your genre is, that's going to be different too. So your structure for like a rom-com is going to be very different from an epic high fantasy or like a, a thriller or horror or anything. So, but you're still going to have the beginning, the middle and the end. But if you look at some of the examples out there, and I actually think what can make you a really good writer is being a good reader. And obviously reading in your genre. And the more that you read, you're gonna start. And if you kind of look at it, you, it's hard to like read books now. Like one, you wanna like read and, and just like enjoy it, right? And be like that, that passive reader. And then there's like that editor side of you, right, Jen? Um, that'd be like, oh, like, I see what they did there. So, and if you start kind of looking at these stories craft wise, then you'll start to see how they're broken down and how certain points happen at certain points in the, in the story to move things along. And then obviously you want to be very specific to, to that genre. And then what resonates with you, because at the end of the day, you're really writing for yourself. You know, you don't want to be overly studying. I think that a lot of us are really overwhelmed, or at least I can speak for myself by how much information is out there of like, do it this way or do it that way. And a lot of times they can even contradict themselves. And sometimes that might not even resonate right with the story that you want to tell or like your authentic voice. So I think as a new writer, you should look at some of those examples out there and, you know, read as much as you can, but you really should be very true to yourself and listen to your gut and just keep that authentic voice. And, and you'll know if it's working or not, because you'll know if, if you're happy and then if you like it, and really that's all that what, that matters. Oh, I love that so much. So going along with that, one of those elements that can be, you know, how to best tell your story is point of view, whether or not you are in first person or third person or what have you. Was that an easy decision for you to make as you were writing Witcher of the Werewoods? Oh, so my, that book is in third person close. And that actually wasn't how I started off. Like when I was initially thinking about it and like as a new writer, I was constantly thinking in first person. And a lot of the books in that genre are in first person. And there are like some diehard readers that'll be like, I only read first person or I only (laughs) read third person. I'm like, and again, like you don't want to like take that in and let that affect you. You need to do like what's right for you. So I did put a lot of thought into that. Like, oh, how do I want to do this? And for me, third person close um, really fit my story. And I've had readers tell me, they're like, you know, it's in third person 
but it feels like it's first. Like I feel really close to that character. So when you were starting to write it, or even in the first draft, did it all start out in first person? Or did no, you, or... when I started writing, yeah, it, it was all third person. Yeah. Cool. I'm like a, a, a measure 15 like times and then cut one. So I was like, I thought it all out first. So like, I will mentally write something probably 20 times over before then I'll sit down and, and write it. Like I'll, I'll play things out like a movie and, and nice. then see, see like what works and what fits best. And, and then I start going with that. So to your point about playing that out like a movie, I love that because the imagination is so cool. So when you have that mental image of what a scene looks like or feels like, you know, if it's the setting or what the characters are doing or what you want any of that to, to feel like, what are some ways that you help to bring that forward? Like how, do, what are some tips that you have to help other writers get that translation, you know, from their head down on paper like that. Cause like you, I think in the pictures too. And I, I love that. I am so glad that we're talking about this because this makes me super happy. I thought everybody did this. And I talked to an author friend once and they're like, I don't understand what you're talking about. And I'm like, really, you don't, you don't do this. You don't think this way. Um, so I, I kind of think of it more like method acting and I will like drop into a character. I'm glad that you're shaking your head. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and, and then I, I'll, I'll feel like what they're feeling and then you just know what they're going to say and then how they're going to react. But obviously, you know, you need to spend some time building up that character. Like, like it's like the tiny little things like, you know, what color socks are they going to wear? Or like, even like, there's like this very silly little test. I'm like, you know, if this character had a hangnail, would they cut it off, bite it off or just rip it out? And then like that right there, it's like so silly, stupid, but it tells you a lot about their personality. And mm -hmm. so when you're, when you're writing, if you can just kind of like, you know, drop into that world and you know, imagine yourself touching it and like smelling it, like all the five senses, those are really big for me to bring into reading because that's how we experience the world too. Um, but yeah, so, that, so what helps me to do that is I kind of need to um, occupy my monkey brain. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that I can like drop into like that creativity. So I will walk a lot. I'll usually walk four to five miles a day. Um, and I'll listen to music and I'll just be playing through these scenes. Like I'll think about, oh, okay, well, this is the scene that I'm going to be writing today. Let me think about it and I'll play it out in my head and, and kind of see how I might want to like move some things around. Or if I'm thinking up of new ideas or maybe like I'm not even consciously trying to think of something and like stuff just gets thrown at you. Does it happen like when you're driving and you would like be thrown like this random idea and you got to yes. like pull over and like I'll dictate it into my phone. Yes, I do that yeah. too. <laughs> yes. yes, I can't tell you how many times I've been I've driven somewhere and the moment I'm in the car and it's like, oh, turn the phone on voice record and just voice it all out or sitting in the parking lot and finishing up the thought just because the idea hit and I don't want to lose it or I'm in the middle of cooking and then it hits. So of course I voice it that way too, but then I can always go back and work it or figure out what else to do with it. And, you know, once it's down on paper, but sometimes you got, you just got to get it on the paper first to at least get those. Yeah. It's like catching lightning in a bottle because it'll like <laughs> flicker. Sometimes you're like, Oh my God, I gotta like get that. It'll be like, you know, 1130 at night and you're just laying down to bed. You're like, oh, I, I need to get up and write that. Because oftentimes like with your, with your energy, like you're most creative when you first wake up in the morning or when you're about to go to sleep. And again, it's like that turning off the monkey mind. So then the rest of you can kind of like think and, and the creativity can like take off. But yeah, you need to like capture, capture those moments. And usually like, if you just have a snippet written down, like I, like you had said, you can like pick it up and then unravel it and take it, take off with it at a later date when you need it. Yeah. And, and I love that you talked about method acting with it because even so whether it's writing my own pieces or editing, I will read out loud, especially dialogue. I'm listening for how are you really, how would you really say that if this scene is happening, are you really going to be this calm? Are you not going to use contractions? Are you 
are you going to maybe have some curse words that show up because you're so frustrated with something, you know, so there's ways to, to implore the method acting. There have been sometimes when it was, I'm reading something, I'm like, how might this physically work out? So literally acting out the space to go, no, I, I don't think this would happen or wait, this scene is inferring that I'm supposed to be doing something. And now that I'm really trying to do this, I think that I've not done this modeling what I've read. I think that I've put my left hand to not even used it, even though my right hand looks like my left hand did something. So, yes. it's, so actually actively reading it out loud or working the scene in that way, if that helps you to get your story across even more, to feel the characters even more, go for it. Because I mean, that's the whole point is that there was one time I remember writing out a scene and I'm sitting there, there was a tear streaming down my eyes and I've said the character had a tear streaming down her eyes. And then somebody else read it. They were like, oh, I was crying during that scene. I was like, see, this yes, is what needed because to have. Like that you're... authenticity like shows through, but yeah, I'm glad that I'm not the only one that acts out things. Cause I'll be like <laughs> lying down on my floor. Like, how does that person like sitting and like, how does that work out? And I'll be like, trying to figure it out and somebody will walk in on me and I'm like, oh. or like, I think I'm, my neighbors probably must think I'm crazy because I, well, I talk with my hands too, but when I'm, you know, thinking through the scenes, I'll be doing that as well. But when you, when you're being authentic with your writing, like when you're crying, and I think most writers are that way, like you're, you're going to cry along with that character because if you as the, as the writer aren't really feeling it, then the reader won't either. So you really, you need to drop into not only like those characters when you're thinking out scenes, but you really need to be present in those moments. And that really shows through in the writing. Absolutely. And, and even if you're working with an antagonist, you know, even when you're working with the those villain. Those are my favorite. <laughs> I know, mine too. And the reason I, I love, like, so you mentioned Dumbledore earlier. So one of my favorite characters in the Harry Potter is Snape. And the reason I love Snape, never mind the fact I thought Alan Rickman was fantastic, but the fact, <laughs> but the fact that he was so gray and the fact that he was so complex, he was well-developed and he was uh, so instrumental, so vital for the protagonist to grow. And that is also the beauty of a strong antagonist or morally gray character or characters, because they help move the hero forward. Yes, yes, for sure. And if, so with the series that I'm working on right now, my villain was just also just such a very, very strong character. Like they could have their, their own series and I would like have to like pull them back. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I know you're very loud and you've got a lot to say and there's like a lot going on with you. Um, and the, book two of the series is gonna show you a lot more about this particular villain, but they're just so, they, they can be overpowering. And I think as, as writers too, you, you need to be, be careful of that as well. It's always your protagonist still needs to be in control. And then they are the ones that need to be making the decisions. You need to make sure that they're the ones that are being proactive and not reactive so there's a balance there between how much that that villain like what the play is is between them um because you know you still want them to have like everybody needs their own spotlight at certain given points in time but you still need to keep the story balanced oh i i i'm glad you said that because i totally agree with your logic and, and i agree that that needs to be balanced because if it's too heavy especially no matter how cool the character is, if it's too heavy, it, it's going to take away from the intention of that story, of that path. So how do you strike the balance? Do you have any suggestions to help another writer who might realize that some other characters are running amok instead of the protagonist do, being able to have more of what they're supposed to? Yeah. So well, actually, I want to like bring up two things. So talking about lightning in a bottle, of course, like something like goes away, but the protagonist still needs to have grit to them, right? Like they can't be like that, that perfect Sally with, you know, everything is going well for them. They, they can't be like that. There needs to be some grit to them as well. But in keeping those characters balanced and keeping them reined in, I like to kind of have like a little list to myself that I put by my writing station 
of of the clarity and the points and like okay this story is about this character and this is why this story is being told um you know what like the what's the big external you know plot what's the big internal plot and when you have that in front of you as a writer it's going to help you stay on track instead of getting pulled off to the side by one of those other side characters right in in like a little bit of like a of a different direction so if you have that list in your and because i'm a list person obviously but if you if you have like that sense of clarity about okay what is the story about who is my main character and you need to keep the focus on them and you'll know when it, you're being pulled away because you're thinking too much in a different character's head you see what i mean like so now you're being reactive as the main character when you need to stay proactive. I love that. I think that was just so spot on because it's subtle. It might, you might not realize what's happening, but if you realize to your point, you have the clarity of what you're trying to do and you're realizing what the protagonist is, you're feeling the protagonist react versus respond, then right. that's, a, that's an indicator something's feeling a little off for your protagonist and going back and checking like okay what's happening here right oh I love that so so much so when you were creating when you're writing this the books and it's fantasy do you have any suggestions that help these characters live in their fantasy their magical world when you're dealing with fantasy and you're dealing with magic, there always needs to be like a cost for it. You just can't have something out there. So there's always um, a consequence for something that will happen. So that's kind of specific to that to that genre. But as far as like characters, look, characters in a fantasy land or if they're characters in like a, a thriller or a suspense or even like, you know, like those children's books, there, there are still those parameters that apply to the real world, right? It's like... You, these are my feelings and how am I going to react? How am I going to deal with this? And I think that's why a lot of readers read, right? Because they don't, they don't want to have like their heart crushed or be stabbed by a sword, but they want to read about somebody, you know, having that experience. And then what are they going to do? Like what happens next? And then you just like keep them moving along. So I think those parameters that apply to, you know, those literary characters are a lot of the same parameters that you know, apply to us in real world. And I think that's why people like, like to read. So even though it would be like a fantasy world, you still have, you know, consequences for certain actions and you still have expectations for things that, um, that are going to occur. I love that. I love that so much because that's, that's helping to create the, the bridge essentially between the, the fantasy world in the book, but it's also helping to understand there's rules there too. It's just, it might look different than your current world, but there's still rules that they have to in, bump up against, engage with, that there's consequences if they don't do something or they did something different. So I, I love that you explained it that way, because that's something that helps people when they are writing those characters, that they are mindful of. No, there's still some things to kind of work through. It's just, it might look a little different than if they were right yeah, especially yeah especially in fantasy you have to have those those hard rules and the consequences otherwise it's you know you could end up with the characters that are just like all too powerful and then there's nothing that can stand in their way and then well then where's the fun in that you know like superman had kryptonite right so everybody's kind of have to have like a little bit of an achilles heel that you get to work with i love that you put it that way that is Really, really cool. And this has been such a fun conversation all about character and character development. I love this so much. Thank you so much, Sonia. Thank you for being on the show. Where can people connect with you? Where can they get your books? Oh, thanks, Jen. Um, I, I love connecting with writers and readers. So the best place to find me is on my website. So it's soniafblanco.com. Um, and my books you can get through that website, or they're also on amazon.com and barnesandnoble.com. And I'm also on all the social media platforms, mostly right now on Instagram. So that it would be the best way to get a hold of me on that one too. But thank you so much for having me. This was such a joy. And I loved talking about the characters and exploring different ideas with you. And, and I hope that the listeners kind of learn something. 
Thank you. I'm sure they did because this was such a fun conversation, but thank you so much, Sonia. I am so glad you were here. Oh, thanks, Jen. <laughs>